with the double bond in it. So if we start with the diene, I like to number the four carbons in the diene and then five and six as the alkene so that no matter which way we use, we move the electrons and they could go this way they're going clockwise they could go counterclockwise in terms of the arrows we're going to end up with a six membered ring with one two three four five and six um and then we're going to always end up with the double bond between two and three and we form the one five bond and the four six bond the transition state for that would basically be partial bonds all the way well partial bonds all the way around except there would be no the partial bonds would be between one and five and four and six so it's not it's not a six-membered ring with the, with partial bonds on the inside there are these two partial bonds here and here that form so that's this is the transition state for the diels alder reaction and so the question is what happens when you put um, different substituents on this ring particularly in the on the diet and there are rules about that in terms of whether the group is electron donating or electron withdrawing my issue with talking about that right now is that we're going to talk about electron donating and withdrawing groups when we get to benzene rings so the example in the textbook is that they added an OCH3 group and so the question is what does the OCH3 group do to that diene um, and there are very specific rules about um, whether you want to have electron donating or electron withdrawing groups on the diene to make the reaction go faster and they're they're based in well they're basically based in quantum mechanics and they're based in what's called frontier molecular orbital theory both of which are beyond the scope of this class if you noticed I kind of X'd out the sections that dealt with molecular orbitals. Now what I don't think I did was I don't think I X'd out the problems that deal with that, but I should. If you don't want to answer those, that's fine. I'll go back and because I'm not going to necessarily go into the molecular orbital theory. So in this case then, if we reacted the double bond, the way I would treat this Again, whether the book would treat this or not, I'm going to have to go through and maybe modify the problems for chapter 19, is that we have an OCH3 group attached to carbon 1. So when I draw out my ring with my 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, I'm going to have an OCH3 group attached to carbon 1. And that OCH3 group would actually both be both on a bold wedge and a dashed wedge. In other words, this chiral center that I'm generating is racemic because I didn't start with a chiral reagent. So I would end up with a racemic mixture. And the, the question is, where should the OCH3 group go? Um, in this case, because I've made this symmetrical, it doesn't matter whether it goes on the top or the bottom because I could flip that around. If there was another group over here, then we'd have to use molecular, we'd have to use frontier molecular orbital theory to figure out which way it's supposed to add. So those questions I'll go through and you don't have to answer those. And I'll go back and I'll give you a list of questions you don't have to do for chapter 19. But they're these ones because I don't want to get into for, I don't want to get into that molecular orbital theory. That would be, that's a whole other class unto itself, which I haven't taught for about 12 years. So I'd have to go back and, and refresh myself on what the frontier molecular orbital theory rules were. 
So when we have a substituent attached to 1, 2, 3, 4, and we'll talk about 5 and 6, basically you just add those groups to 1, 2, 3, or 4. Now for 5 or 6, there's going to be another set of rules for those. Does that kind of make sense? I mean, I'm blowing off the question, but... So in terms of our deals alder reactions, let me just pull up let me pull up the um, the PowerPoint that goes with that. There are several rules that you want to work with um, that we have to obey when we do the um, deals alder reactions. And one of the things I'll point out here is, let's see, that's February 22nd. So that's all, so Friday's stuff is already posted. I'm a little bit ahead for once. Oh, as you can see, there's some, there's a take home quiz that's up here that you can pick up on your way out. Um, so let's see PowerPoint notes. That. And the rules have to do not necessarily with the regio selectivity, which is whether the methoxy group, the OCH3 group, would be on the top or the bottom, but more along the lines of some of our rules. So here are the rules. The number one rule is that the diene has to be in what's called the S cis conformation. So what does that what does that mean for the S cis conformation? Basically with the diene with the diene what we have is we have a sigma bond here. And so S stands, this S stands for sigma bond. So in order for the, the diels alder reaction to occur, carbons 1 and 4 have to basically be able to sit over the two carbons of the diene. And in order for them to be able to do that, so if I have my diene like this, in order for them to be able to sit over the diene, the two double bonds have to be cis. But S cis means that there's a rotation around that sigma bond. So when the double bonds are cis, this is called the S cis conformation. If it was if the double bond was like, the conformation was like that, in terms of the double bonds now being opposite, this is the S trans conformation. And the S trans conformation, carbons one and four are too far away to sit on top and match up perfectly with the double bond. That's too big of a distance. Because what happens is if you is that here is my diene down here is my uh, all right what will let me right what will let me draw so here is this part's the diene and so these two carbons right here are the ones and they're going to have to sit perfectly at the same distance as the alkene and so what happens is they form the bond at the same time so 
So that's that's the first rule is we have to have it in the yes cis or the yes trans confirmation. Now he'd say there is free rotation. So which one of these two confirmations is favored? The problem is that it's the it's the S trans that's favored. Because the issue is when you have the S cis confirmation, oh, that's not going to work. What happens is, is that the hydrogens, these two hydrogens, are going to be really close together. So that S cis conformation is going to have a hard time being perfectly planar, which is what it's going to have to be in order to react. And so it's going to basically what it's going to do is it's going to take energy to make this planar and get then get the deals alder to react. So the more stable conformation is S trans. That's more stable. So what we have to do with any kind of non-cyclic diene is I'm going to have to add energy to it in order to make it S cis. And once it's S cis, then it'll immediately react with the alkene. So once once this is in, once this is in the S cis, it then immediately reacts with the alkene and forms the Diels Alder product, Jacob. No, not in, in lab. Let me come back to lab. Because we actually we actually over uh, there are ways to overcome this. So you've got to put this in the S cis. Yeah, partially the reason that in lab we had to reflux was to put the butadiene into its S cis conformation. But also the biggest reason we had the reflux was because butadiene is a gas. And so if we wanted to do our reaction from last week in lab where we reacted the we reacted butadiene with maleic anhydride to make that product, um, we would have had to like bubble in butadiene. And it, it's not that butadiene is, is hard to get. I mean, all of your tires are made of what's called polybutadiene. Polybutadiene is rubber. Whether it's synthetic rubber or whether it's rubber, nobody makes tires from the rubber tree plant anymore. I mean, when we started, when they started to use rubber, they almost killed all the rubber tree plants. So they had to come up with a synthetic way of making the butadiene and then making polybutadiene. So it's not that we did did that. It's just our experiment said we're going to make that by using the sulfoline or the butadiene sulfone. So what happened was that when we heated this in lab, it would then this pair of electrons would go here, this pair of electrons would go here. We would break the carbon sulfur bond. So what we ended up doing is forming SO2, which was the a white gas that you saw was SO2 and it was SO2 reacting with the water to form a little bit of sulfuric acid um, and then we made the butadiene which would have been in its S trans conformation so as we're refluxing we're not only cracking this to make the butadiene but then it's also causing it to flip around and if you didn't heat it to a high enough temperature you wouldn't have cracked this, and so you'd end up with just maleic anhydride and the butadiene in your sample. 
And so we had to make sure that we refluxed it sufficiently to do that. The procedure that Dr. Simmons and my lab used, we used a lot more and made a lot more product. And then Dr. Kwan did a micro scale, and what I found was the micro scale, you may have had a 10, you, you had to be really careful that you actually cracked it, whereas the other one was a little bit better. So it's possible you could have ended up with very little product or product that was what the product that was wet that kind of looked like it had um, it was partially melted and the reason was because you didn't crack the butadiene sulfone completely so when I taught lab over the summer I'm like this isn't working I need a new procedure unfortunately that's what the internet's for because then I can find five other five other places that have published, well, I've put on the web that experiment. So that's what we used. So that's why we had to heat it, to crack it, and then to get it to go back into its SS confirmation. The lab is relevant, lab is relevant to lecture and vice versa. So, particularly when the experiments are pretty close together. All right, so rule number one, you've got to put the dyne in the s cis conformation. Now, the problem is, and let me ask, let me, let me write a reaction and ask this question. So, Because there's, there's a point which you could be confused. So let's say that I do this reaction. And one of the things that we'll find out is when we know about, when we know formally about electron donating and electron withdrawing groups, the dyene should get the electron donating groups and the alkene should get the electron withdrawing groups. And a C triple bond N is something that we'll learn later on is an electron withdrawing group. The C double bond O with the anhydride that we used in lab is also an electron withdrawing group. So I just I just made this alkene reacting that that diene. Now does anybody think that this reaction will not go, that this is a no reaction? From rule number two. And rule number two says whatever the stereochemistry of the alkene is, that will be preserved in the product. Well, that's good that nobody wants to say no reaction because what happens is sometimes people confuse the S cis conformation and they say well this is a no reaction because this alkene is trans and you said it had to be cis and so we it, the, the diene has to be S cis but the alkene can be either cis or trans it could be either. And what happens is, is if you think about the double bond coming down and plopping on top of the alkene, the diene coming in and doing this one-step reaction, whatever the stereochemistry in the alkene is, it's going to be stuck in the product. So that when I make my six-membered ring with my double bond, and again, I... As you're doing these for the first couple of times, you may want to put numbers on here so you know where everything goes. The double bond will go between carbons two and three. And then when I look at carbons five and six, those CN groups are trans. And so that means that in the final product, they must also be trans.
So what I found is sometimes people confuse S cis requirement with the cis or trans of the alkene. So a trans alkene will react. So will a cis. But whatever the stereochemistry is, that's going to be the stereochemistry of the final product. Not really. Okay. It's just kind of there to be when that diene comes down and plops on top of it. It's just it's stuck in that in that stereochemistry. There's never like a group or anything attached that will make it not react. Not really. Okay. Over here, if I start putting like groups in in those two positions that are big like methyl groups, then I'm going to really have to heat it in order to force that to come back into the S cis. So sometimes you'll see that as a question. What happens if there's two methyl groups here? I'm going to have to heat the snot out of it in order to get it to go into the planar conformation because those two methyl groups are going to be just hitting up against each other. Does it mean I can't do it? No, it just means it's going to take a lot of heat. Mixture. You would always get, yeah, you're always going to get a racemic mixture of this. So again, our rule for forming one enantiomer over another is that you need a chiral reagent in order to make a chiral product. And neither one of these reagents is chiral. They have stereochemistry, but they don't have chirality. They're not R and S. So what you would end up, so whether you wrote the product like that or whether you wrote the product like this is irrelevant because they're basically the same product. As a matter of fact, these two are an antiomers of each other. And I know that because if I took this compound and I rotated it 180 degrees, and lined it up with the top one, they would be mirror images. And right now they're non-superimposable because the top carbon's dashed, the, bottom, the top carbon's bold. So you'll always make a racemic mixture unless you start with a chiral molecule. So any general questions on the Diels alders? So the basic Diels alder is a butadiene, is a 1,3-butadiene molecule with any alkene. This has to be S cis, and this could be either cis or trans, but whatever the con whatever the stereochemistry of the alkene is, it's going to be preserved in the product. kind of with me. So the third rule, which I'm going to not go to right this moment, deals with what happens when I have a cyclic diene. Now one of the ways that we can force the diene to always be S cis is to use a cyclic diene. And our cyclic dienes are things like this. 1,3-cyclopentadiene. And you'll also see, at least in problems from me, you'll see 1,3-cyclohexadiene. Because I made these systems cyclic, that group is pinning the dying to be absolutely cis, S cis. So these molecules react very, very quickly and very easily. 
so much so that actually because the the deals alder i used to do was that we used to do in lab um when i taught second semester regularly which kind of is now but there was a long break when i didn't we we use cyclopentadiene to react with that same maleic anhydride molecule that that we did last week and the problem is when the cyclopentadiene lies around in the bottle it decides that it's going to um, react with itself so it reacts with another cyclopentadiene acting as the alkene and the cyclopentadiene acting as the diene and so it makes what's called dicyclopentadiene and so what you have to do is you actually have to heat that slowly and crack it crack the dicyclopentadiene molecule and then distill off the cyclopentadiene and keep it at like minus 20 degrees or else it re it reforms so it would take me like two days to make all the cyclopentadiene because i had to crack it and it's a little toxic so we decided to sort of eliminate that and use the sulf use the sulfoline but there's an advantage then of pinning the diene by using a cyclic one but now that gets us to rule number three what happens when we react a cyclic diene so when a cyclic diene and a substituted alkene are used the and i should say here a cis substituted alkene is used then you form the endo product versus the exo product. Okay. So this only happens with a cis alkene and a cyclic diene. Right. So let me show you a couple examples. Here's example number one. This this one So if I took the maleic anhydride that you guys used in lab and I reacted it with cyclopentadiene, I automatically have the cis alkene and then my diene is now pinned in the S cis conformation. This reaction occurs really fast. And what happens is, is that I'm going to number my carbons 1, 2, 3, and 4, and then 5 and 6. So if I do this, so if I get this product, here's my six-membered ring. I mean, the beauty of the Diels Alder is you always end up with a six-membered ring cyclohexene. And that's why Diels and Alder both won the Nobel Prize. Not only did they form one carbon-carbon bond, they formed two and a ring. So they both won, they both won Nobel Prizes. Although Alder was um, Diels's um, student. Kurt Alder was American. Um, Otto Diels was German. Organic is not a, an American science. It was developed in Germany prior to having a lot of prominent American organic chemists. Kurt Alder was one of the first. So most of the organic chemists either learned or were in Germany at the time. Or Russia, but who knew what was going on in Russia at the time? Because in the early 1700s, you know, you had Stalin and you had cutting people's heads off. And, Ukraine and all the bad things that happened there. So Alder was like one of the first first noted American organic chemists. So you had this six-membered ring that's formed. Now, what's attached to carbon one and four? A CH2 group. So one of the ways we can write this is to write the CH2 group being attached to carbon one and four like that. And when we do that, 
we have to choose. Do we want to make the CH2 bold or dashed? Because here's what this structure looks like. This structure looks like this. As it stands now, here's carbon 1, carbon 2, carbon 3, and carbon 4. This is the CH2 of the five-membered ring. So there was my original five-membered ring attached to carbon 5 and 6. So what I actually am making is a bicyclic or a bicyclo compound. And since there's what, 6, 7, this would be a bicyclo, then we'd have a parentheses, it would be a heptane, and it would be a 1, 2, 1, 2, and a 1. So it would be a bicyclo 2.1. Heptane from last semester. And I just throw that out there because we've seen it. It was a long time ago, but we have seen it. So that's how the molecule sits right now. Well, that's how the molecule sits right now with the double bond between two and three. So we know that we have to put this maleic anhydride molecule, it has to go cis on 5 and 6. So if we look at the 5 and 6 position, there are two, uh, there's basically two positions here. There is an equatorial position and there is an axial position. And so the Diels Alder quantum mechanical rules are very specific that these two carbons, the re this group, has to go into what's called the endo position. So this position is the exo position. These two are exo, and then the two, these two are down, and they're in the endo position. So it's kind of like these are axial positions, and the exo is equatorial. And you might think, well, how is my iPad set up on my phone? Okay, so what does this mean? Here's how I kind of think of it. Just stop. Thank you. Here's how I kind of think of it. I kind of think of it in terms of endo and exoskeletons. Right, an exoskeleton, exo means what? Outside, endo means inside. So I kind of look at this molecule right here as having kind of a cylinder. It's kind of its own cylinder. And so the groups that point out are exo, and the groups that point down in the cylinder are endo. I mean, that's just how I think of it, to remember those two. So what happens is we have no choice but to force by quantum mechanical rules this product is going to become endo so let me let me go to let me go to another slide here how do i go to another slide that has these stupid markings on it Okay, so here's my, here's my ring, then the C double bond O, the O down here, the C double bond O would be attached like that. And then there would be an H and another H equatorial. So that's how the endo product would look. And that's going to be the only product of this reaction. So it's going to have the C double bond O, O, the anhydride carbons are going to be attached 
axi are going to be attached to the axial positions. And that's the only product that's formed. Now, that's kind of hard to draw. So if you wanted to draw that product in this representation, you first of all have to choose whether to put the CH2 group bold or dashed. So when I write that cyclohexane representation with the CH2 on the bold wedges, what it means is I'm like up here looking down on the ring. That's what I'm seeing. So that means that the cyclo, or that means that the um, maleic anhydride molecule would look like this. These two positions would be dashed. So the critical part here is that the bold, that the bridge, this is called the bridge, that the bridge and the substituents have to be on opposite wedges. And that is, that's the endo product. If they were on the same kind of wedge, that would be the exo product. So in the Diels Alder rules, you must always, with a cyclic diene and a cis alkene, both groups must go into the endo positions. Okay, they can't go anywhere else. Does that make sense? So then you may ask the question, what happens if they what happens if they're trans what happens if the alkene is trans so what happens if I react cyclopentadiene with my trans alkene well if it's trans that means that the product has to have the trans stereochemistry so again, I would have my, my bridge, my CH2 in bold, but then one CN would be bold and one CN would be dashed to indicate that this was indeed the same trans stereochemistry that this one was. So the stereochemistry is preserved. What do you call this? Nothing. It's not endo. It's not exo. It doesn't have a name. So it's only endo or exo if the if the alkene is cis. It's exo when it goes into the equatorial positions. It's endo when it's in the axial positions. And when it's in the axial positions, that's the only product that's formed. That is a that is a molecular orbital rule that we are not going to get into. It it has to do with the frontier molecular orbitals. So, and and I avoid molecular orbitals in this class. Because I don't, because we don't have enough time to go into that level of complexity. If you want to learn about those, you can always take physical chemistry, or you could take some advanced organic class that hasn't been offered for like 15 years, but maybe it'll be offered someday. Because then we can get a little bit into the details of that. But it has nothing to do with thermodynamics or kinetics. It is totally based on molecular orbitals. And, those, and that's actually one of the things called a Woodward-Hoffman rule for, for, for Robert Woodward, who was a 
probably the first really well-known synthetic chemist because he made lots of natural products, smoked like a fiend. There's always a picture of him with a cigarette in his hand. I've yet to see. I, I have one in my office that apparently he signed. I have those things. And then Rode Hoffman um, was a theoretical chemist at Cornell. If you've ever seen like the chemistry, there's a PBS series on the wonders of chemistry. He's the guy who narrates it. Um, so I do have a book signed by him too. I gave two books to one of my colleagues when he was down at Case. And he signed both of them and then she took the other one. So I don't know where that one is. Well, I know where it is. It's far away. But so that the Woodward Hoffman rules are what causes this and it just doesn't. It's just we're not going to get into it. So what you have to remember is stereochemistry is preserved. With a cyclic system, if you want to draw it this way, or if you want to practice and draw it this way, I'm okay with that. But like in this case, you would have the CN. You would have one CN down and one CN up. So that's, that's the basics of Diels Alder. I think there were a couple other topics, uh, or the last topic was sort of the reaction of a benzylic or of an allylic um, position in SN2 reactions. So just kind of quickly, If you react an allylic halide with a strong nucleophile, you are going to get an SN2 reaction. And you might say, well, is the double bond here going to affect the rate of that SN2 reaction? And the answer is yes, it will. But in order to explain why that's the case, we actually have to draw out our SN2 transition state, which we always have to do whenever we're doing an SN2 reaction. And what happens is, is that we know that the, what would be the charge on the, on the hydroxide in the transition state? Delta, delta minus, how about the chlorine? Delta minus, how about this carbon? It is delta positive. We've never really written it that way, have we? Now let's do that. It's got to be delta positive because it's in between two delta negatives. Well, what does the double bond here do to that delta positive charge that would make this transition state more stable and would cause this reaction to go faster. Is it like some of the involuntary negativity negativity where it's the slightly positive current? Yeah, it's going to stabilize it. So a double bond's going to stabilize that carbon by being able to share some electron density with that delta positive charge. So even in an SN2 reaction, allylic carbons react faster than primaries because of that extra stability in the transition state. And so this introduces the idea that this is actually delta positive. Now I know some people have always written that carbon delta positive, but it's something that we, are, we just did formally today. So if this, this double bond will help stabilize that, making the, inter, making the transition state more stable, lowering the activation energy, making the SN2 reaction faster. So allylics can play a role even in SN2. 
we know they're going to play a role in SN1 because they're going to form a stable allylic carbocation. And so they're going to increase the rate of that SN1 reaction. Okay, so I have um, a take-home quiz for you. Let me just say one thing. What I've done is I've given you a six-membered ring and add you to add, and asked you to add, react um, H plus and H2O to that ring. Remember that when you add the acid, you're going to do 1, 2, and 1, 4 addition. In the folder I will release when I get back to my office, I'll release some practice problems. There's a lot of practice problems on doing 1, 2, and 1, 4 addition. There's narrated answer keys to go with them. But remember, you're always adding the H plus to which carbon? If I'm going to do this 1, 2, 1, 4, for addition, like we did on Monday. Where do I add the H plus? Carbons one or carbon four? Doesn't matter in this case because it's symmetrical. If I add it to one, I'm going to make an allylic carbocation, write the resonance structure, react it with water. When you react it with water, it's going to be two steps, and you have to write both steps. So for this one, you don't have to write transition states. All you have to do is write the intermediates, the resonance hybrid, label kinetic thermodynamic. Okay? So you can go ahead and take one of those. If you have questions, email me or come see me. Um, we'll plan on that being due on Friday. <coughs>